Hello, Fort Collins. It's time for this week in virology, episode number 291, recorded on June 24th, 2014. Hey, everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. We're coming to you today from Fort Collins, Colorado. We're on the campus of Colorado State University, and we're at the annual meeting of the American Society for Virology. Joining me today from North Central Florida, Rich Condit. Howdy, Vincent. Hi, everybody. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> the weather like out here? Oh, weather, weather, weather. Got to do the weather. So it's, uh, it's beautiful. 68 degrees out according to this, but, you know, go outside. It's beautiful. Cloudless, I think, and uh, nice forecast. The 68 degrees, by the way, is 20 Celsius. Yep. Is right? It was the dew point. Oh! Uh, it's, it's okay. I'm just kidding. Okay. No problem. <laughs> also, 53. 53. Yeah, Excellent. I got it right here. Also joining us today from southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Hi. <laughs> How's the weather in Michigan? Oh, I didn't check the weather in That's Michigan. That's okay. No problem. I'm, I'm here. That's what matters. <laughs> and we have two guests joining us today over there on the other table from the Salk, the Salk Institute, Cloda O'Shea. Hi, guys. Hi. Welcome to TWIB. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And right next to Cloda from the Erasmus Medical Center, Ron Fouchier. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to TWIV, your second time. It's my second time, both at conferences. And now you're going to be really famous. <laughs> uh, not as famous as you, I think, because this is your 291st time, I heard. It's a lot, right? Yes, a lot. You guys, is this your first ASV meeting, both of you? My first ASV, yeah. You like it? Oh, it's fantastic. Yeah. Your first as well? Yes, me too. All right. Well, welcome. And we have a great audience, as you've heard already. Thanks for coming. We really, every year, we're amazed that you keep coming back. So we appreciate it. How many of you are TWIV listeners? <laughs> All right. Great. It gets bigger every year. How many are TWIV addicts, like Jerry Luban? <laughs> a few. We're going to start a 12-step program. <laughs> So I just wanted to tell you guys my highlight of the meeting so far. Damn. <laughs> yeah. Okay, you get it? Yeah, I get it. Right, okay. You got a highlight? Uh, it was about the same. It was that same talk. The whole thing was great. The koala talk Koalas, yeah. was just wonderful. How about you, Kathy? Got a highlight? Uh, that first session was pretty neat because it started out uh, with an unusual thing, which was that the keynote speech was moved to the morning of the first plenary session. And that was David Baltimore. And he and three other people mentioned things that happen in the cell during virus infections that are magical, meaning we don't know what they are. So <laughs> I thought that, that was kind of fun. Yeah, I like magical also, yeah. In fact, that's one of our title possibilities, got magical in it. Okay, before we start talking uh, about science, I want to mention we released TWIV 290 this past Sunday, and the same day, one of the guests on that TWIV, Rick Lloyd, was uh, giving a talk here at the meeting. So that's a pretty cool coincidence, right? So you can get a double dose of Rick Lloyd. Okay, let's find out a little bit about you guys. I want to hear about where you were born and raised and educated. We'll start with you, Cloda. Yeah, so, um, so I was born in Cork in Ireland, and uh, you know, in a, in, in a pub I still have my accent, but uh, <laughs> I had to speak slower since I came over here. Um, but I did my bachelor's in biochemistry at uh, University College Cork, um, and I did uh, uh, microbiology as well, a double, a double uh, sort of mm. a, a major, I guess you would call it over here. And then I did my PhD in, um, um, at the Imperial Cancer Research Fund in London, ICRF, I think it's the Crick Institute, uh, it's, it's called now, basically. Um, and there I actually worked with um, um, uh, Mike Owen, um, and it was sort of the time of, uh, they made the first T-cell receptor um, uh, um, alpha uh, knockout mouse. And I was really interested in, um, I mean, I was fascinated by science, basically, and, uh, and I really wanted to use science to do something good, if I could, because don't tell the salt, but I would do it for free <laughs> if necessary. Um, and so um, um, I thought the immune system uh, impinges on everything, including cancer, viruses, or health. 
Um, and so that it would be really interesting to study how uh, we develop an immune repertoire that can actually combat uh, mm -hmm. disease in multiple forms. So we wanted to understand the sort of uh, molecular signals that um, determine T cell selection, positive selection in the thymus. And so uh, we, um, um, we discovered that um, uh, uh, RAF, uh, uh, downstream kinase now in, in the uh, growth factor pathway, actually will um, determine the positive selection. It, will, uh, as, uh, it basically checks out if you have a proper T cell receptor that's appropriately restricted to MHC, but not, um, not overreactive. Um, and then also, we, uh, it was a key question at the time as to whether how you actually knew you, uh, T cell receptors are made up of an alpha and a beta chain, but how do you know you have a beta chain if it's not paired with an alpha chain before rearrangement? And I, that was my first encounter with adenovirus because um, to test that hypothesis, we made a novel transgene where we took um, uh, the adenovirus uh, E3GP19K um, ER retention signal, which is what retains uh, the MHC in the uh, endoplasmic reticulum. We actually made uh, a novel mouse where we actually retained uh, uh, a beta chain in the ER to actually test if you needed it uh, to be on the surface. So, so that started, you know, getting me really interested in these tricks, uh, these amazing proteins that viruses have. Um, and then, um, but then after my PhD, um, I, uh, I took a year off in Africa. Um, I won a place on an expedition with, with Raleigh International. So we were transferring stable antelopes back in the wild, uh, working with some of the last nomadic tribes and, uh, and building a school in the Caprivi Strip. And thankfully, my postdoc advisor <laughs> kept uh, my position open because I, didn't, I wasn't even near the internet. So I don't do this, by the way. <laughs> but basically, I sent a postcard and said, um, you know, um, I really, you know, want to explore a bit of the world before, you know, going on to the, this postdoc. And uh, uh, will you keep my place open? And um, uh, my postdoc advisor was Frank McCormick. And turns out, as luck would have it, he had spent a year in Africa when he was 18. So um, they thought I was his imaginary postdoc, though, because <laughs> by the time I turned up. But um, yeah, so I did my postdoc um, um, at UCSF, and um, I was going to stay in, in T cell development, but I was really lucky to be exposed at ICRF to a lot of different science. And um, I thought it would be really good to be able to come at problems in different directions. And I actually almost worked with Jim Allison, uh, who actually flew me out to Berkeley um, uh, because he was working on CTLA-4 at the time. But I got fascinated. Frank McCormick at the time uh, had uh, uh, been at ICRF, and he had proposed this um, which is really fascinating hypothesis about um, um, effectively um, uh, 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 how you would target tumor suppressors, the loss of tumor suppressors, and was working on the first oncolytic viral therapy. And basically, um, um, I went there to understand the role of the immune repertoire on that, but we, we figured out that the mechanism um, was not, had not been fully understood and discovered to be um, what the actual therapeutic target was. Um, and then, um, sort of after that, uh, exploring viruses, um, I ended up starting my own lab in the Salk in 2007. 2007. 2007. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So when I tried to uh, get you for this TWIB, you were out climbing rocks. I was. <laughs> I was. I was. Yeah. Like, that's something you've done a long time. Yeah. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Um, uh, yeah. I. I, uh, I don't know. My mind rests when I'm near death. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> the one time I'm not thinking about science to some degree or other. It's a bit, it focuses the mind. And uh, yeah, I used to do a lot of mountaineering, and I had. Um, I actually. Took, I fell 500 feet, I took out both my legs actually as a postdoc. Um, and so to recover, I thought how, how you would get balance is to climb rocks. So I started climbing in Yosemite. And uh, I mean, I would have fired me as a postdoc, I have to admit, because <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was more climbing bum than scientist half the time. But um, uh, it was, uh, I mean, it's amazing. It really frees your mind. Yeah. And uh, just being out on the outside, I think it's, I think it's really important to be able to sort of go at a problem intensely, but then just to be able to come back from it. And, mm -hmm. and I find real, uh, just being in the outdoors and, and climbing um, uh, really energizing, actually. You don't so. fish, do you? I don't, I don't. Okay, so a lot of virologists fish. Is that right? Yeah. OK. But All David right. Baltimore is a big fisherman. Is that right? Yeah. Oh. Ron, what about you? Uh, I grew up in the Netherlands on the south, uh, the Belgian border. I uh, did a Bachelor of Microbiology in Wageningen in the Netherlands. And uh, while I was doing the, the, the microbiology, HIV became known. I was lucky enough to uh, get a job working on HIV already in 88 uh, in Amsterdam at the uh, CLB at that time with Frank Miedema and Hanneke Schuitemaker. And in 1990, I started a PhD program there <coughs> on the phenotype determinants, looking at 
viruses that infect macrophages versus viruses that don't. And as you know, this has now become known as CCR5 and CXCO4 mm -hmm. tropism, which then, of course, wasn't known. Um, in, I graduated in 95, and then I moved to Philadelphia, to Mike Malin's laboratory, to learn a little bit more hardcore uh, molecular virology, studying functions of the VIF and VPR proteins. That's the work that ultimately led to APOBEC uh, mm -hmm. stories and things like that. <coughs> and I worked on uh, nuclear import of pre-integration complexes. <coughs> so really the mode by which viruses infect non-dividing cells through mm -hmm. nuclear localization signals and things like that. And then uh, in 98, end of 98, I moved back to the Netherlands to join up Osterhaus's department in Rotterdam to start a new group on respiratory viruses. So he already had groups working on respiratory viruses, but not, no molecular biology. Uh, at that stage, of course, there was no reverse genetics, so that was one of the first goals for me to start working on. <coughs> and the reason to go there was because just before that, 1997, Osterhaus was one of the guys who discovered H5N1 in Hong Kong. Yeah. And so that really made the flu field bloom, I think, uh, put flu back on the map, and also uh, got my interest, and so I decided to start working on H5N1 with, uh, with App. And in the meantime, also, we, uh, we set up a vi virus discovery programs using you know, next-gen sequencing quite early on already. And so along the road, we discovered human metanumavirus, uh, coronavirus NL63. We were involved in SARS outbreak 2003, mm. novel flu virus subtype H16, and then two years ago, MERS. So it's been a very good choice, I think, to go to Osterhaus department. It's, it's a lot of fun. Mm. It's like a, a, a boy's candy box to work there. There's always something going on. You don't climb rocks, do you? I don't climb rocks in my spare time. I try to, sp to spend as much time as I can with my family. I have two daughters <coughs> and a wife. And so I like to go camping, so, but then without climbing. And, uh, <laughs> I'm a lazy guy, so... Uh, so er <laughs> Erasmus is a, is a research institute, is that correct? It's a medical center. It's a medical <clears throat> center, okay. Yes. And so is it, uh, how is it funded? I mean, do you, is it government funded? No, the, all hospitals in the Netherlands are private these days. They used to be uh, public, but they are now private. And so there's a, a little bit of a complex mix between government and, and private funding now. For the research parts in these medical centers, they are mostly dependent on grants. Uh, our department is about 150 people, and I think we have five positions from the university. The rest is all coming off grants. Okay, and likewise, Salk Institute's a research institute. Yeah, it's a private research institute. It has its own pro endowment plus uh, grants come in, right? Yeah, so it has its own endowment, um, and then NIH and foundation supported, yeah. Okay. Okay, let's start with your science, Cloda. I thought we could talk about oncoproteins. Uh -huh. I saw you gave this cool talk the other day about one of the ad pro oncoproteins in your recent work. So for the TWIV audience, can you give us the background? Why did you start working on these proteins? Yeah, so, um, um, so originally, so my original introduction to them was, um, um, so, so many of the key tumor targets to this day are many of the key targets that regulate growth um, in health and disease um, were actually discovered uh, initially with the small DNA uh, tumor viruses um, and their proteins. And what's really interesting about the small DNA viruses is that um, um, they really are entirely dependent on the cell for their replication. And by that, I mean that they don't have a lot of their own sorts of protein synthesis um, or polymerase sort of apparatus or nucleotide metabolizing enzymes. So what they do is they have to come into quiescent cells as their natural target. <coughs> and drive the cells into S phase, <coughs> which, which en enables the concomitant replication of the double-strand DNA genome. And so basically to do that, they've, um, so you have a small genome, so basically there's a huge evolutionary drive on either having very few proteins, and preferably very few proteins that are small. So basically it's sort of this ultimate minimalist, right, this sort of Spartan cadre of uh, proteins. And, um, and, um, and as such, these, are, uh, uh, these proteins then will actually hone in on the key hubs that, that regulate the cell. And I find it amazing, actually. I mean, I, I came to virology late because I, I really came from cancer signaling biochemistry, but 
it's like 11 proteins against 26,000 to take over a cell. I mean, how remarkable, right? Mm. And most of them, the, the majority of them are less than 20 kilodaltons, right? So that they really do what, um, you know, coming again from a cancer sort of biochemical perspective, we say can't be done. In that there are these small proteins, um, and yet they actually take over these integrated cellular hubs, many of which are 300, 400 kilodaltons uh, mm. in size, right? Mm -hmm. And they don't just bind to one protein, they somehow bind to multiple. Uh, that's a remarkable uh, trick. Because one of the major sort of focuses uh, now in sort of this post-genomic era is um, we have many of the molecular targets, but how do we design small molecule therapies? And the reason you need to be a small molecule uh, as a therapy is you have to get into the cell, so you have to somehow diffuse across a membrane, hence why you need to be small. Um, but then that small molecule often has to get into the cell and sort of disrupt large protein complexes, right? And they, the general consensus is that protein-protein interactions are not druggable, right? Um, mm -hmm. But everything's not druggable until it is, of course. But <laughs> um, and the idea is because you have large solvated surfaces which can't be disrupted by um, these proteins. And when I started my lab, um, um, I thought, you know, we, I, really the focus of my lab is, you know, uh, to go after the intractable tumor targets that are deregulated in every cancer, the tumor suppressors, protein interactions, epigenetics. And I think viruses have just the most tremendous role uh, to play there. It was really uh, those that dis uh, led to their discovery initially. And I thought, well, and I was amazed that none of the small, uh, the adenovirus oncoproteins, even though they, they led to the discovery really of the RB tumor suppressors, E2F, um, I mean, Nemo, all of these different things had actually been crystallized, right? We, had, we hadn't a single structure. They have very little sequence homology, okay, which is, again, unusual because you might hypothesize that they could be sort of protein mimetics and now compete cellular proteins. And that'll happen with them. You can see much more homology in the larger mm -hmm. DNA viruses and others. They, they can rob more directly. But basically, they, they don't do that except for very short peptide motifs. And so it really suggests that they've evolved novel principles of design because they really, um, they're, they're there for one job only, and that is to win, right? That is their task, to win. And there's a very interesting and different evolutionary pressure on them than in the cell. In that any time a cell involves a new protein, um, it has to sort of uh, be compatible with the continued existence of the cell and also the inherent protein interaction networks. And to evolve a new protein, often you may go through sort of high energy of activations of protein folding, which can lead to uh, unfavorable solutions. This is what's happening in the field of uh, directed protein evolution right now. And that can lead to aggregation and uh, Alzheimer's, amyloids, and, and disease. But viral proteins, these oncoproteins, adenovirus, the cell is going to die anyway. That frees it, actually, because it, now its proteins do not have to be compatible with the continued existence of the cell. They just have to win. And that's cool, actually, because now it can come up with really interesting uh, solutions because in thinking about sort of signaling, uh, which is really uh, as my origins, in, um, this, you know, there was an old adage from Paul Nurses that never be the magician's apprentice, which is you never turn something on that you can't turn off, hmm. right? Um, and hence you have post-translation modifications, uh, and most of the cancer can be really simply defined as taking the dynamics out of the system. And I think that's why the viral proteins have been such extraordinary probes. They take the dynamics out of the system because they can, right? And that's what I want for a drug. I want a dominant drug. And so I thought, well, why don't we figure out what their principles of design are? And maybe actually that would lead to new hypotheses upon uh, which we can uh, base it. And so we took a structural genomics approach um, we have some other uh, um, uh, structures uh, sort of, I hope, coming out, uh, um, uh, coming up soon. Um, but it was really interesting, um, uh, you know, five out of the 15 early viral proteins that we looked at um, uh, were, that were soluble, they all formed oligomers, right? And they weren't fixed oligomers, and actually Peter Wright had a beautiful paper actually earlier this year on sort of this non-allosteric mechanism with intrinsic disorder regions, which uh, um, I'll refer to, which, which may explain at least the E1A part. And in the cell, actually, very few, uh, you know, most of the cellular proteins in uniprotein are not oligomeric. So it suggested there was an extremely strong selection for oligomerization. And that just spurred a thought. I'm like, wow, wouldn't that be cool, right, if you had now a small protein? But then basically it's like a transformer. It just starts to build. So you would buy into a protein, and then it suddenly could disrupt the structure and actually build these new complexes. And that would actually now give you so much more bang for your buck in a small genome, actually, and solve really an essential biophysical problem is how does a small protein come into a cell where you have a high concentration of complexes, right, and disrupt stable complexes? I mean, that's a remarkable trick, actually. 
Um, and so um, I asked my, uh, I have a, I was fortunate to have a brilliant structural biologist and scientist working at Hornu, um, who had uh, uh, studied actually P53 and the, uh, at, um, at, at UCSF, and he was also fascinated by how structural biology can contribute in going after these proteins. And I asked him to solve this, uh, this I shouldn't have done it actually, but um, uh, um, this protein called ORF3, which was a puzzle to us. It was, it's, it's 13 kilodaltons, 116 amino acids. And it's all singing and all dancing in that it takes, it inactivates Sonus's P53 target genes, disrupts the MRN uh, DNA damage repair complex, which forms these large 0.5 micrometer across foci in the nucleus. Mm -hmm. KML bodies, again, these huge bodies in the nucleus, right? And also uh, uh, TIF1 alpha. And it was a conundrum. I mean, 116 amino acids, these are very different targets, okay? And somehow it's coming in, and you already have this huge, you know, highly stable complex, and it's coming in from concentration zero, and it somehow blows them apart, right? And it also formed this extraordinary web that weaves through the nucleus in a way I've never seen, in that the fibers are not, they're not straight or fixed. They seem to curve and bend and twist in a way that's just downright unnatural. Um, <laughs> so that was known before you started? That was known, yeah, because these tracks, but they were uh, just mysterious, right? Yeah. And so the, the real conundrum then and puzzle for us was um, uh, we took it in. So I, I didn't know if it needed cellular proteins to assemble. Mm. Um, and because uh, um, it may have needed a nuclear matrix, it may have needed subfactors. So um, uh, very fortunate I was talk to be surrounded by scientists who work in very different disciplines. So we thought with my friend Jeff Long, um, um, uh, I thought, well, you know, plants and animals have diverged 2.7 billion years ago. And, you know, it would be pretty unlikely for this thing to, <laughs> if it needed a protein to self-assemble. So does it self-assemble? Is the ability to self-assemble embedded in its own atomic structure? And we fused it to GFP, and that was another conundrum. And we put it into tobacco leaves. Um, and uh, um, I'll tell you a funny story, I think. But um, we put it in, and, and we put it into the. Are you going to tell us or not? I will, I will, okay. yeah. We put it into the leaves, right? And so basically, we put it into the tobacco, uh, these tobacco leaves. And then these crazy cool fibers, you know, were there. And like, we got so excited, right? Um, uh, we, we left the confocal on. We were there at night, my post, and we like basically headed to the bar. <laughs> we, like, the plant had evaporated, the water was gone, but the damn structures were still like shining. <laughs> At that point, we're like, whoa. <laughs> and they're really stable, okay? Um, and, and they also had a, a very different trick. We had fused it to GFP, okay, which is three times the size of this viral protein. Now, if you do that with actin or tubulin, where they're a very fixed structure, you'll disrupt mm. a polymer, mm. right? But somehow it was able to still assemble, which suggested that. You know, it wasn't end-to-end -end fusion. It wasn't anything we'd really seen, and there was more like a gel-like composition, almost like a sieve. And that, that really was very interesting. So at that point, we knew then that it must be an oligomer. Um, and so we uh, screened uh, and, and actually looked. It was, um, I think, the original mut mutation may have been described by Matt Weitzman or, or maybe um, um, Pat Hearing. But we, we wanted to now look for a dominant negative oligomer. So we looked for mutants that actually uh, not only were diffuse themselves, but caused the wild-type protein to become diffuse. Mm -hmm. And again, this was an interesting interface. The structural biology, you would probably not have done it like that, but you know, uh, with Horn's experience and mine and uh, other colleagues of the Salk, we, we came up with this way of, of, of looking for oligomerization, a simple cell-based assay, which then subsequently allows you to look for functional complementation and, and assembly with uh, proteins, which I, I think would be very useful for a lot of bar proteins mm. because I, I suspect these tricks will be conserved. So having a so you needed to do that because to make a yeah. soluble version, you needed that for crystallography. Yeah, sorry, absolutely. Yeah, but yeah. then to make sure it was still functional, it had to be able to inhibit something, right. the wild type protein. Right, because yeah. if you see the protein go diffuse, you have no idea if it's yeah. just misfolded. Um, and, and the thing is completely insoluble in bacteria. And, uh, and this is a major problem with polymers. It's really fiber diffraction and other methods. And we've been developing some new techniques with our collaborators to do sort of structural biology in situ now. But so then once we had that, it, it was a dimer suddenly, it was a really well-behaved dimer, and uh, with a little bit of more protein engineering, um, we were able to get the first uh, crystal structure of a complete um, adenovirus protein at, at 2.7 angstroms. And um, that was a good day. Uh, <laughs> but um, basically, um, we looked at it, and you know, I was hoping, I mean praying at this point, uh, uh, that uh, it would look like something I recognized in the P53 pathway, it would look like some sort of a polymer. I mean, no chance. It, it was basically, it, look, it actually, it's a dimer, but it looks like a, a, an RNA binding protein. It's the RRM family of proteins. But instead of binding RNA, basically, as the dimeric interface, it actually will use it for dimerization. And so then we, you, do, you can do this thing where you search across the PDB 
to look for protein homologs. Um, and um, it's very curious, and, and I don't know the answer to this, but maybe, uh, maybe you will actually, since you, you know everything about viruses, is um, that um, when, we, when we use DALI and other things like that, um, effectively the, the high, some of the highest homologs um, was actually a sort of a transposase, but also actually the E2 DNA binding domain from papillomavirus and eBNA1. Okay, if you, and that's if you basically line them up, and they have a, a root uh, uh, mean squared deviation of about 2.7 and uh, 3 angstroms. But yet, the, 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 the homology between the proteins is less than 10%, the sequence mm. homology. Does this protein bind DNA? No, it, it doesn't, because it has, a, it has basically a PI of uh, um, uh, 5.1, and it's highly negatively uh, charged, whereas most proteins that bind to DNA will be positive. And you can see that in the, the HPV2, actually, and, and, and the DVD. But it's really curious, right? I mean, why on earth, right? These, proteins, these viruses are not thought to share any sort of an evolutionary origin, and yet here we are with this, this sort of one sort of a module, and I'm not sure if it means it's converged on because it's a particularly efficient mm. type of a module, and that's actually true. These are very diverse structures. They're, very, they're like 90 amino acids in the minimal domain, yeah. and they basically can be used to assemble. So I want to test my yeah. understanding of yeah. the structure of this yeah. thing, because uh, I'm thinking about just one subunit, the monomer. Mm -hmm. The C-terminus is structured. Um, it is when, it's, it, it, when it comes back. It, we think it's an obligate dimer based on basically the um, surface area that's okay. actually sort of... So, but uh, in the crystal structure, yeah. the structured part is the C-terminus, is that no, correct? No, it's, it's, it's basically... Um, I got it's, it backwards? Um, yeah, it's, um, it's, the C-terminus actually is, there's a flexible loop and a sort of, it, it flicks around and so has this tail. So the unstructured part is the C-terminus. Yes. Okay, so I had it yeah. backwards. Yeah. But there is a structured part and an unstructured yeah. part. And the unstructured part, if you tether that to the structured part, that's when you get the dimer structure. That's right. yeah. If that's left to go around, that's when you get the big... Well, Fire. yeah, that's, that's when we think it, it actually sort of will flick these things out, sort <coughs> of uh, trying to catch uh, some other So proteins. the ability to form a fiber is dependent to some extent on the, on the unstructured part. Yes, that's uh, right. Doing it. But, okay, so, and this thing, as the fiber, interacts with a bunch of different mm -hmm. cellular big complexes. Is it the unstructured part that's doing that? By like an induced fit or something yeah, like that? Yeah, yeah, great question. So, um, so basically, um, it's... Um, mm. There's, there's, it's, it's both. So for PML, you don't, we actually made, um, I don't know if it's in the paper, I don't know if we're still yet to publish that, but uh, basically if you actually make a, a truncation, if you get rid of the C-terminal part, so we basically deleted the C-terminal part, and then we fused it to lamin because you need avidity, um, avidity-driven action. That's totally fine for interacting with PML electron 24. Yeah. You do not need the C-terminus at all, actually. Okay. To show that it was an induced fit, um, so basically, the, um, it targets the MRN complex through this uh, C-terminal, and we thought, well, maybe it's just avidity, and maybe this uh, dimer, this uh, sort of dominant negative dimer, it was in the incorrect structure uh, in there. So we actually fused that to lamin to see if we could find to MRN, and we actually then, as well, mutated that out. But um, it actually, um, it's an emergent structure, and it actually is really cool. Um, when it flicks that tail out, now that creates a new binding site, which mm. can bind to MRN. But it also, and this is the real trick to it actually, this is what's really cool, uh, is it also creates another oligomeric interface because, um, I, I don't think we, we discussed this uh, at great length, is it's a mystery, right? If you keep breathing and going back and forth and oligomerizing, why would you be so stable? Why would you favor the oligomeric state? So you would have to suggest that actually there would be another oligomeric state then that would lock it into that configuration. And that's actually what's happening with that tail. So it creates another oligomeric uh, interface, which then will uh, keep it oligomeric, and that also creates an emergent binding site. Okay. So they're going hand in hand, actually. And that's, um, um, so, so in one case, uh, it creates an emergent site, and the other, it's avidity. And it, it actually, I mean, when we eventually got to that point, it, 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 it explained a key thing, which was so mysterious to us, is that how can something be a polymer and then bind to all these other proteins? Because if it binds to all these proteins, then actually it shouldn't assemble, right? Because it's binding to these proteins. And the answer was that actually it's only able to bind them when it is assembled because you need avidity-driven interactions. It's using very low affinity interactions and or an emergent binding site. So it only binds to these things in the oligomeric state. And that was, that's the key trick, actually. So the binding is what is inactivating the cellular proteins or something else? So, well, that's... Um, so the, um, yeah, the dogma has mm -hmm. been uh, with PML because it's... A tumor suppressor, actually, in this case, is a misnomer. It, it's really a translocation. Most of the trim proteins actually tend to be... Um, uh, so uh, PML is a tripartite motif protein. 
which actually takes three different oligomeric domains. And we actually think that's the sort of cache to the uh, oligomeric uh, uh, mouse protein of sort of the, the viruses. In that, um, uh, so basically for every action there's an equal and opposite action. And so basically if you drive oligomerization, how do you, um, uh, how do you then um, recognize an oligomeric machine? And so the C-terminal tails, including you know, PML is actually, um, uh, it's unstructured. Uh, well, it's, you have different structures in it, but we think actually what it does is it actually will recognize a mass action of oligomeric proteins, and that's actually how you uh, begin to, to see these different things, and that can be effectively more on a protein machine. So in that case, yeah, but now we've knocked down PML, and it's, uh, it's a really interesting result. In some cases, it's using PML to enforce the suppression of certain targets, because um, I think when viruses come into the nucleus, they disrupt certain interactions. It's basically a, uh, uh, a natural, a sort of physical surveillance mechanism because basically there's looped regions at the MHC class 1, uh, 6P23 is associated with that, and you disrupt those interactions, which if you want to repress, it will actually lock it into place, it nucleates there, and it enforces the repression, and in other cases, it prevents the activation and the dissipation <coughs> of PML that can occur at other target genes, and, and that would explain as well a lot of the gain of function effects with PML, and that it's, it's never really knocked out, actually. It's, it's, it's always a fusion where you put it with RA or alpha, because now you get a gain of function where again, now you can drive oligomerization and drive reactions forward by putting on another module, which is, mm -hmm. which is very mm -hmm. fascinating, actually. So, so in that case, yes. And with MRN, uh, functionally, yes, it, it, it does inactivate it because you can phenocopy uh, its effects in facilitating replication by knocking down MRN. So by mm -hmm. that criteria, mm -hmm. yes. But as to whether MRN is the direct target, that's never actually been shown. So there's an interesting theme here with the oligomerization. Yes. And you said that there are some other adenovirus proteins that oligomerize. I'm interested in how, do you have any sense for how broad a theme this is in virology? <laughs> so actually it's been really great at this meeting. People going, oh my God, I mean, my protein does this. And my brand, we always just threw that bit away. Or, you know, <laughs> and I'm like, oh. um, So I, I think, I mean, if, if you think about, you know, I mean, just from a, a very, um, it's, a, it's a little bit of a teleological argument in this case, but it, nevertheless. There is a great, I mean, one of the universal themes of viruses is that their genome is smaller than that the host. So it's a piece of malignant code that, that must outwit it, right? And they have to encode these proteins that do that. And, you know, they're generally going to be small. And there's just a, a general size thing. If you have to disrupt something large, then, you know, how do you do that? And you're either really, really competitive uh, with, with a certain structure, but then you're dependent on outcompeting actually a high concentration of a pre existing uh, sort of uh, molecular binder in the cell, right? So it's interesting. So what, what happens with avidity is that if you bring, go back to classic michaelis menten kinetics, um, um, and I'll explain this in terms of Clathrin, in fact. Um, basically, you have an affinity of uh, protein A for protein B, which will drive a complex, okay? And that's a given affinity. And we've been very focused on high affinity interactions, even for drug targets. But actually, there's something very interesting that will happen where, um, uh, and that's, that's in solution. That's based on uh, diffusion or fluid-based uh, kinetics. But actually, if you have a fixed structure, a matricity structure, in fact, uh, and that's why we use beads, that's why viral particles are amazing, right? They're basically matrices. They, 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 they hold things in these fixed assemblies. So you lose uh, um, um, some entropy, but basically it, 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 it doesn't diffuse then, right? That's why, you know, if you pre-couple your antibodies to beads, you can often get very strong interactions, actually. Not because the affinity has changed, but the likelihood of diffusing away or, or multiple binding sites being engaged is higher, right? And the thing about avidity is that both targets must be multivalent, right? Um, that's why uh, you count with T cell receptors or antibodies, IgM, because all the bacterial coats or viral coats, they always have multiple, right? It's a really good way of not binding to non-self. I mean, it's awesome, right? Because that's what they're going to do. So you just target the central principle of design that pervades all of our different beasties, basically. Um, and I think the same thing is actually occurring in the cell is that, um, you know, we, we heard today, you know, RIG-1, uh, MDA-5, Sting, you know, these different complexes uh, recognizing assemblies. So I think that viral proteins, one way that they can do it is they can nucleate viral replication centers. It's their nucleation points, frankly, right? And that's a really good way of uh, just a very easy biochemical principle uh, to actually um, attack uh, without invoking any structural um, sort of similarities, actually. And so basically, um, uh, um, yeah, you, you would go to a central point and nucleate. So when a virus comes into a cell, we're really interested, where do viruses go? So we're doing all this new three, 3D genome sort of uh, uh, mapping. 
Uh, do they go to the intercommon spaces? Is that defined? Do they address themselves? Is it the same in a lung cell versus a tissue cell? If we do IPS, how does that change, right? Um, and does it actually, is it a diffusion-based principle where it just ends up in interchromatin spaces? Then you start to concentrate and now you recognize that concentration and your proteins go there. Because it's basically also, remember, there's two ways of concentrating something. One is that it's by principle of design and the other is by polymer exclusion, an excluded volume, which is effectively uh, achieved by the polymer nature of chromatin uh, in the nucleus. So we've become very interested in that. So I do think it's going to be conserved because now what you can do is you can take a weak binding site, lock things in, right? and actually um, 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 a, a sort of attack them, and you don't diffuse. And a really, really important point is this, actually, is that, um, you know, because we, we have this problem with small molecule drugs, is, you know, you're always trying to get enough drug in to inhibit your target. But often the target you want to inhi inhibit is the one that's assembled into a complex, mm -hmm. right? Most things work as complexes, transcription factor complexes, ribosomes, whatever you wish. They're, they're multivalent <coughs> machines, more or less, okay? Uh, and you basically can achieve high localized concentration. And so basically, you really just want to attack that, especially if you're starting off at like zero expression level. So how do you do that? And one way is you basically say, I'm going to take weak binding sites, but I'm going to make it so that I assemble. And now I'm only going to recognize that complex when it's also assembled, because that's the only way it can work. Because if the target <coughs> is monomeric, it will diffuse away. So you basically, it's a really clever way uh, of actually honing in on the key target. And I think, I mean, viruses are so smart. I think it's, uh, uh, it's probably a, a recurring mechanism. And, you know, I was struck by ICP-8, actually, and some of these structures, these viral replication centers, uh, T, and, 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 but uh, uh, E1A. And, and you might ask, then, why have we missed this, um, in a way? Um, I mean, you can't IP or 3 from the cell. I mean, it laughs at you. It's basically, you know, in the tube at the bottom going, see ya, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so we need to develop an, uh, new ways of uh, doing this kind of biochemical interactions. Um, it's the same with their structures. Um, and, and you will miss these completely, by the way, in a two hybrid or a tap pulled up. Mm. They mm. do not come out, right? For a two hybrid, they don't even get into the nucleus because they're oligomeric. And for a mass, uh, if you think about an IP biochemically, it really shouldn't work for a lot of proteins. Because effectively, you're basically bursting apart the cell, you increase the diffusion in the fluid-based kinetics, and now basically anything with a high KD will diffuse. And if you assemble in a context-specific way, and potentially driven by actually the nuclear or other environment, um, you break those interactions and you break apart what was holding it together in the first place. So we're now beginning to develop new tools uh, to begin to look at these sorts of fluid phase transitions. Um, Mike, Rosen had a, um, Mike Rosen had a beautiful paper actually on, uh, on this with Acton. Um, uh, and how to, how to look at it. I mean, uh, clathrin, is a, yeah, clathrin is a perfect example, actually, right? So you don't want to have all these like empty pits, right? So what do you do, right? Because that would be bad, um, is uh, clathrin is very, very low affinity for AP1. Terrible, never pull it out, awful. What happens is as AP1 will actually go around a bud as you begin a virus coming in or any other incoming particle, it does bind to clathrin. But now as clathrin comes in and binds as AP1, it drives the reaction forward because now clathrin starts to oligomerize with itself. And so again, mm. you start to count the molecules, right? And then basically the membrane breaks apart. If you fuse the lysome, clathrin dissipates. And so again, you know, even in terms of the viral uh, uh, viruses coming in from the nucleus, from all of these different places, I think we're dealing with these, uh, these complexes. I think it's why particle-based vaccines are, work so, you know, are having precipitates is important because that's what macrophages want to recognize. Again, another way of not recognizing yeah, self. Yeah. And so basic, and, it, and it's not, I think, now just the particles. It's actually the stuff that remains in the cell. And I think we might want to take a closer look at um, how we can actually use that, how we induce death, and how we can now really use these in a synthetic way to decorate them with peptides of our choice because it's going to permutate through all the different combinations. Um, and in that sense, you don't need to know sort of what sort of fixed angstrom length you may need to engage a certain complex, it's just going to achieve it randomly. And so it's, this yeah. it's basically a permutation generator, right? You know, I should take it to Vegas, but I haven't yet, so. So oligomers, <laughs> everybody. I'll go home, work on oligomers. So the, the paper that I highly recommend you, you check out the paper, it was in Cell, right? Yeah. And it's open access, I believe. Yeah. And there's a nice little movie associated, a paper flick, they call That's it. That's right, yeah. Where Cloda is uh, acting out the interactions herself, so I, I highly recommend that. It and includes we, some of the movies that you showed in your talk. Okay. Yes, it does yeah. have yeah. some of them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they're in the supplemental, or they're they're all available, I think. Yeah. So let's move on to 
transmission of avian influenza virus. So when we first, uh, when I first had you on TWIV in Dublin, um, you couldn't talk about any of the science behind your work on getting H5N1 to transmit in ferrets. Now we can do that. So let's, let's go back to that. You, the, what, what's the rationale for trying to get H5N1 to transmit by aerosol in ferrets? Well, so the bottom line is that we, over the last decades, we've seen thousands and thousands of zoonotic events. So you, respiratory viruses that jump the species barrier from animals into humans. Sometimes with bad consequences, sometimes not so bad. But every time these, these zoonotic events happen, the question is from WHO, from international health organizations, could this virus acquire human to human transmissibility and become pandemic? And we know this happens. You know, we have four endemic human coronaviruses. There are eight endemic human paramyxoviruses. All of these find their ancestors in animals, mm -hmm. originally in bats, and then from bats into domestic animals, and presumably onward into humans. So we know that several of these vi virus families can acquire the ability of human to human tra transmission, and then keep causing problems for decades and decades and decades. Now, for flu, this is a process that occurs much more frequent than for paramyxo and coronaviruses, right? For flu, in the last century alone, we've seen four pandemics with animal viruses. Now, what discriminates the animal viruses from the human viruses is airborne transmissibility. So you, you put avian influenza viruses or pig influenza viruses in a ferret, it won't transmit through airborne route. And with airborne route, I mean via aerosols or respiratory droplets, either of the two, we, we don't really know how, but one of those two. But human influenza viruses, either pandemic or, or epidemic, all of these transmit through, by, via humans through coughing, sneezing, talking, but also in ferrets through the air. And so I think it's, it, it's a pretty important question to, to, uh, to understand what makes a virus transmissible between, a new, between new hosts. See, there's been many calls from health organizations to virologists to predict which of the zoonotic viruses are going to be pro problematic. You know, an individual zoonosis is bad for that individual or the family, but a, zoo but a zoonosis that becomes transmissible is going to be a global health problem. And so we really need to understand how these zoonotic viruses acquire mammal-to-mammal -mammal transmissibility. And that's what we were trying to do. It's not just a matter of what <coughs> mutations are involved, isn't it? A matter of what mechanisms are at That's place, right. right, that's right. Of course, mutations are nice because if you know exactly which mutations to look for, then you can do surveillance. You can, you can screen viruses, you can sequence them, which we can do very, very quick these days, and you can predict which one of these viruses has particular genetic traits that would make it more transmissible. Mm -hmm. But of course, we know that, that different mutations might have different effects, or, or different mutations might have the same effects, so it's functionally equivalent mutations. Uh, the, the genetic backbone of a virus may affect how, what the effect of particular mutations is, so sort of epistatic interactions. Uh, and so just, just relying on mutations is probably not a wise thing to do, but these mutations are going to be associated with some phenotypes, right? So, in 2011, we wrote an opinion paper about what we thought would be the phenotypes that an animal virus would need to acquire. And one phenotype is replication in the upper airways of humans. So most of these avian viruses replicate in our lower airways, but not in our upper airways. And so switching that would be beneficial for a virus to require airborne transmission. Is that because the aerosols come from the upper tract? Largely? That's right. Yeah. It's simply, uh, I think, a matter of quantity. If you, if you would exhale air and that all of that air would, would pass by your epithelium in your upper airways, and so you would mm. be more likely to get it out. Um, the second thing is, of course, simple a matter of quantity. Mm. Uh, so if, 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 if I have 10 particles in my nose, it's quite likely that any of these 10 par particles would reach the end of this hall, but if I have 10 to the 6, you better watch out for the back. <laughs> right? So, so this, is, this is another step of, of very easy, easy thinking of, of things that might help. And, and so we started testing those hypotheses. But of course you have to start with a virus that is not transmissible. That's the only way to do it. Right? So you take a virus that's non-transmissible and you give it traits that you think are important that might increase the transmissibility. 
And that's what we did. It's a very simple hypothesis-driven scientific project with, in my opinion, a very, very targeting a very important research question. So the use, the use of H5N1 was controversial because it has been shown to infect people and kill some of them. Are there <coughs> other avian viruses that would have been, say, safer to use? Well, any, any influenza virus that, that, to which the human population has no immunity yeah. would be, could be considered dangerous. Now, of course, we know that H5N1 itself is, is a pretty pathogenic virus. Yeah. So a lot of people die if they get that virus. But, uh, so, so, of course, we could have taken a low pathogenic virus, but I, I don't think that the public health dangers from doing this work would be any different, to be honest. But secondly, if we, if we would target H5 and 1, we would hit two birds with one stone. We would first address a very basic fundamental question, but at the same time we would address the issue whether H5 and 1 that's now causing outbreaks might actually acquire airborne transmissibility. Yeah. And there's only one way to show that H5 and 1 virus can acquire airborne transmissibility, and that's by making H5 and 1 virus airborne transmissible. That's the only way to show it. So, uh, uh, Vincent started, you, we've discussed that on the one hand you get mutations out, but as Vincent and you have already discussed, it's the mechanism that's important. So, from what you've done so far, you've isolated a bunch of these different viruses that, are, that have mutations of one sort or another. What do you learn about mechanism? Can you gen make any generalizations? Yeah, so the, uh, it's, in fact, the, the story is becoming incredibly simple. Right, so you, uh, there's, there's been a publication by Yoshi Kawaoka's group just last week in Cell Host and Microbe, which I think is another fabulous piece of work from Kawaoka, where he recreated uh, a Spanish flu-like virus. Uh, so taking H1 and 1 genes and, and putting in uh, mutations that he thought would, be, would make it airborne. And in fact, the traits that he sees are the same for H5 and 1, and are the same that we see, that we have seen retrospectively in the pandemics of the last century. So. The, the phenotypes that we see are the same. And the first phenotype is you need to switch receptor specificity. Receptors in the upper airways, alpha-2,6 sialic acids, are preferred for airborne viruses. And so avian viruses like to attach to receptors low in the airways, to three receptors, and that specificity need to change. And a virus can do that with different mutations, right? There's not one mm -hmm. set of mutations that can bring it, but it's the same phenotype time, time and time again. And then the second thing we see, and that was completely new from these studies on H5 and 1 and now also H1 and 1, is that the virus, as soon as you switch receptor specificity, you make the HA less stable. Mm -hmm. so the, and, and that needs to be compensated somehow. And this compensation seems to occur, again, by a variety of mutations can do this, either at the trimer interface of the hemagglutinin or very close to the fusion peptide that make the uh, hemagglutinin more stable with respect to fusion. So you now need a lower pH to trigger this conformational change in AHA, and the virus also becomes more thermostable. And so th this was a phenotype that was absolutely unknown until we did the h 5 one work, and now everybody's going back, of course, to look at the previous pandemic viruses, whether that was the case there too, and now it's absolutely clear that it that, that was the case, studies by uh, David Steinhauer and Jack, uh, Charlie Russell at St. Jude have shown that also there, human versus avian viruses for other subtypes, you see this change in stability. And then the third step is this step about 10 particles in your nose versus 10 to the 6. We are now starting to identify additional mutations that can boost polymerase activity of the virus mm -hmm. when it makes a switch from avian cells to human cells and from the avian body temperature to the human body temperature. The intestinal tract of a bird is about 42 centigrade. The upper airways of humans is about 33. That's a, almost a 10 degree difference, which is huge for the polymerase complex, apparently. And so that needs to be compensated too. And by one mutation that we introduce in H5 and 1, we can completely shift the preference for temperature of an avian virus. But there are, again, there are functionally equivalent mutations that can do the same thing. And so these are the three things that we are now starting to see. There might be more. Uh, we might, it, it might be that the, the, the three phenotypes we've seen now are dependent on the strain that we have used. There might be a fourth or a fifth. That's possible. We just, then we just need to do a bit more work. So uh, because I read Vincent's blog, 
Is that a problem? Uh, no, it's okay. It's okay. Uh, I'm aware of uh, another similar study that just came out from uh, Daniel Perez's laboratory. Is, is Daniel here? No? He's at the meeting, but not okay. in his room. <laughs> um, with, what was it, H7? H7. I forget what the neuraminidase subtype was. Yep. Similar set of experiments, but uh, my, my understanding is it's a different constellation of mutations that you don't even, he gets transmissibility without even the receptor switch, correct? Absolutely. And, and picks up a couple of new genes. What's your perspective on that? Well, I, I think that study is a very interesting study, and uh, this is science, right? So science comes with unpredictable answers sometimes, so we, you, you see exactly the same phenotypes play again and again eight times, and then you throw the dice a ninth time and you get a different answer. And so Daniel is, of course, doing more work to find out what's going on. I, I think it might have to do for, for, with mutations in, in the neuraminidase, right? So mm. the mm. HA and NA need to balance their activities. And it's possible that what Yoshi and I are seeing in hemagglutinin could be compensated by a neuraminidase. It's, it's clear that his polymerases have some mutations and, and he might be looking at functionally equivalent mutations from the ones that have been described, but some that we si simply haven't seen before. And so that work certainly needs a lot, of, uh, a lot more follow-up. Uh, and I, I know he is doing that at the moment. So the public is focused on the idea of taking the mutations you identify and using them to predict emergence of a transmissible strain. But it's, it's not that, it's the function, as we said earlier. Yeah. So can you take circulating uh, H5N1s and see if, well, we know about receptor switching, but HA stability, if that's trending towards uh, the phenotype that you see. Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, so that's actually one of the things that we conclude after our last publication earlier mm -hmm. this year, where we describe these very simple phenotyping essays. And we can simply uh, test the uh, temperature stability of a virus. You, know, you take a virus that you grow up, you incubate it for half an hour at 56, and then you test whether it's still a glutenate. How, how simpler can a test be? And that is what we measure. That's, and that is a, a surrogate test for doing this, mm. these slightly more complex fusion assays of, at a different pH. But those can be done too. So if you have a pre-screening of temperature stability of viruses, yeah. and then for, you do a second confirmation by, by doing a fusion assay, I think those would be great added values to surveillance studies. Well, that's very interesting because now this is the mutation and mechanism thing again, because my first thing was, oh, well, you would look for these mutations in the mm -hmm. wild strains, but no, not necessarily. If you understand the mechanism, <clears throat> you can uh, devise mechanistic assays to address whether these, regardless of the actual mutation, well, I, the wild ideally, viruses are trending towards Ideally, them. in 10 years, I know everything, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and if I know everything in 10 years from now, then we can look for, for mutations. But I, 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 have, I know my own limitations, so I think <laughs> going for the phenotypes is, is much, much safer. Than that. I, I mean, I want to emphasize this because, as you know, the press really doesn't understand this, this mechanism approach. All they say is, well, mutations are not predictive. And there are even some scientists who say it doesn't do any good to look for these mutations in the wild. So how, I mean, we have to really hammer in the idea that it's, it's mechanism that we're looking for. Right. And, and it, it's, um, I think it's, I can forgive the, the lay audience for not understanding everything that scientists do. Sure. And you know, the lay audience might be a little bit short-sighted. But, but scientists should know that some science takes a long time. It might, some science might take 20 tw or, or 30 years before it, we really understand the whole thing. That doesn't mean that if there is no uh, application tomorrow that we shouldn't do the science. We still need to do the science because we simply need to understand what it makes a virus transmissible. If it takes 20 years, it takes 20 years. Well, what bugs me is the I the statement by some scientists actually that this experiment is not worth doing. Yeah. How would you know, right? Exactly. It, science is so inherently unpredictable mm -hmm. that you really can't say that for any experiment. You have to do them all. Right, well, the, the, the one thing they argue is that, that, that you have to balance, right? So you have to, ba to balance the risks of doing this work and the benefits. And so, first of all, they think that the benefits are, are close to zero. And so the balance then yeah. goes wrong yeah. very quickly. I think that the, the, the benefits are huge, and so does the vast majority of the flu community. Uh, and, but there's still the balance with the risk. But what they also don't seem to get is that 
the biosafety conditions under which we work are enormous. We, mm. the, the, the labs that we work in were specifically built to do this work. They were spe specifically built to contain airborne viruses. I, spelled, I spent millions and millions of dollars on building these facilities. They are under supervision by the US and the Dutch governments under enormous oversight. You don't want to know how much, what, what sort of safety and security regulations we go through. And so this is also a misperception that we are taking any risk here. Right? So, so weighing risks and benefits, if, if, the, if, if the benefits are considered nil, then of course you shouldn't do the research. But if, 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 the, if the risk is close to nil, then you know, any benefit, benefit you would decide to do the work. And that's how we come to do this work. We ought to take TWIV to his labs. <laughs> what? Well, we're actually building new labs. I saw that you, uh, you with TWIV, you visited the Boston BSL-4. I think yeah. that was great. Yeah. And I think you're, you're, you're welcome to come over uh, after the summer when, when our new lab is going to open, which is a, a slightly different concept from BSL-4 in, in Boston. But it would be interesting. So we, we now built a complete new facility. And you'll be welcome uh, for, for a grand tour through it. Okay. My bags are packed. I'm ready. All right, we'll be <laughs> going. <laughs> but, but now, so no moon suits in our facilities. <laughs> uh, our, our, in our facilities, we have the experiments in moon suits. Right. And that means that you would just be able to walk around in contrast to what you did in uh, Boston. Right. So, the, the, again, the press is always bringing up accidents that have occurred in high containment. But those are quite old. They've happened a while ago. And things have changed, as you say. Con containment is much better than it was. Accidents will always happen, <coughs> but you do the best you can, I presume. Yeah, if, uh, so I, I'm, I'm also involved in advising Dutch government on safety. And, and a few years ago, we wrote a, a report on incidents with GMO viruses. And it's pretty, it, it makes you really, really happy to write these reports. You know, the, the only incidents really that are being reported frequently are over the last 20 years were experiments with pox viruses, people rubbing their eyes after doing a vaccine experiment, which is a silly thing to do. I've, <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've seen them and it, it doesn't look pretty. And, but, but those are really the, the main incidents that happen in a laboratory. And these are con confined to an individual. You know, these are yeah, not yeah. Uh, environmental health risks. And, and, and also the US documents that, uh, that have been written on this, they actually show that the biosafety conditions work. You know, there are a lot of incidents reported, hundreds every year, but an incident is not an accident, and an incident is not a human exposure. Now, if my computer stops that controls my isolator cages, mm -hmm. I have to report it as an incident. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that anybody gets exposed. And on top of that, even if an individual gets exposed, the biosafety conditions are such that you prevent onward transmission. Right. right? If you work at General Motors, you might get killed but you're not going to kill other people. And that's that same... That <laughs> <laughs> Have you read the news lately? <laughs> but, <laughs> but in a biosafety lab, the same thing applies, right? So all the, 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 the safety conditions are, of course, aimed to prevent each and every single one exposure. But, but on top of that, there are multiple regulations mm -hmm. to make sure that you don't transmit it onward. And, and if you look back, all over history, there's not a single case of a major laboratory outbreak from viruses l like the ones that we work with. And so mm. I think the, the agreements from uh, Asilomar have really worked and, and we should be happy about that. We should keep that. Uh, and, but if, if, you, if you don't know how biosafety conditions work, then maybe you shouldn't talk about it. You know, maybe you should mm. uh, refer to the experts. So I, I want to, we have to wrap this up because I'd like to do some picks okay. before we close. But I have one more question for you. I've always wanted to ask you, of all the viruses that we know of, is there any one that keeps you awake at night? No, no, not a single one. Yeah, I feel the same way. <laughs> yeah, if you, if you see, so viruses are everywhere. You know, I, 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 I recently saw this, uh, this presentation by, uh, what's his name? Uh, Bel, Bel, Bamford? Bamford. Bamford, Dennis oh, Bamford. The virus universe. It's just amazing. You know, these viruses are everywhere. Most of them really don't do anything. There's a very few that, that, that make you sick, as, as, as your TWIF announcement says. <laughs> but there's only a very, very small fraction that, that, that kills you. But if you, if you see what virus research has done over the last decades, you know, most of these 
in fact, in the long run, we can handle, you know, look yeah. at HIV, hepatitis. So, now, uh, you know, it's, some viruses might cause some short-term danger, but they don't keep me away. Okay, good to hear. We don't want you losing sleep. All right, let's, let's uh, don't leave yet. I know you want to get to a session at 1.30, right? We will finish in five minutes. All right, I want you all to be here for the end because it. I like the applause. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna do. Kathy, Rich, and I are gonna do some picks. Let's. Kathy, what's your pick for today? So my pick is some beautiful math images. So it uh, relates to a book, and it, it's a blog site in the Guardian. And so I have uh, a couple of them here. Um, just really beautiful math type images. Um, you can probably also get the book. I haven't done that, but uh, they're just really beautiful things to look at. It's too bad Dixon's not here because I think he would Loved appreciate it, yeah. them. So too. this is a book as well, huh? Yeah. yeah. He, this author, or the blog writer, just chose some of his favorites. Have you the bought book. the book? Not yet. It's your own pick. She pick yeah, she'll buy it. Right. That's, why she, that's why she doesn't pick a Lamborghini. Or something. <laughs> right. Rich, what do you have? Uh, okay, real quick. I have uh, a little out of character, an academic pick. Uh, quickly, I had the opportunity to go to a meeting of a local infectious disease society, Florida Society of Infectious Diseases. And there was a hepatitis C um, talk, and uh, in the process of the talk, he addressed a question that I've always been interested in, and that is whether or not hepatitis C is uh, transmitted sexually. And um, uh, everybody tells me no, but I've never seen any data. Here are the data. This is a, a, a paper from uh, what? Journal of American Journal of Gastroenterology. That's a 10-year study in an Italian population of 895 monogamous uh, couples, one of whom had hepatitis C, looking for whether or not there's transmission. So we're talking about 8,300 person years, and just for your information, 1.8 sexual encounters per week, <laughs> which uh, uh, translates to uh, three quarters of a million sexual encounters. And there were three, yes. count them, three transmissions of HCV, and the genotype that came out the other end didn't match the partner. <laughs> okay? <laughs> so the chances. <laughs> According to that study, the chances are Zippo. Very interesting. That, that's why you picked that. Right? Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, my pick is a initiative by Google to get more women in computer science. You may have heard about this. They donated $50 million to start a program to do this. It's on a website called Made with Code. Uh, there's also a blog post about it. And I think this is great. And I call for some big pharmaceutical company to do the same thing for getting more women in science. Let's give $50 million to a program uh, to encourage young, young girls to get into uh, the sciences that we all love. So I think that's pretty cool. We have two listener picks. One is from John who writes, Dear Twiv Gang, uh, Advances in Life Science Prize winners gave talks at UCSF. The talks are now online. It gives a link to a YouTube playlist. Really, some really good talks by people that you know are part of that series. And Dave writes, hi Twivies, I think we are the Twivers. Here's a candidate for listener pick of the week. It's a website by Adam Rubin. Adam Rubin has also written a book of some, some of your listeners may be interested in surviving your stupid, stupid decision to go to grad school. <laughs> <laughs> I first learned about him from my son who was an undergraduate with Adam and we followed him as he has combined his interests in science and comedy. Aren't they already the same? <laughs> Uh, anyway, enjoy. It's really pretty funny. And uh, David is a professor of microbiology at Penn State Hershey, David Spector. So that'll do it for our picks. And that'll do it for this episode of TWIV. You'll be able to find this at twiv.tv, also on iTunes. And it, we love getting your questions and comments. Send them to twiv at twiv.tv. And I want to thank everybody for participating today. Ron Fouché is from Erasmus Medical Center. Thank you, Ron. It's a pleasure. We will be visiting you. Okay? Yeah, that would be great. After <laughs> the summer, it should be ready. Cool. I'd love to do that. Uh, Clota O'Shea is at the Salk Institute. Thank pleasure. you very much. Yeah. I'll be there in the fall. There's a Salk yeah. uh, 60th anniversary. Absolutely. We'll uh, have we to can talk some more. Yeah, for sure. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank Thanks. you, Kathy. This is fun. I learned a lot. 
and Rich Condit is at the University of Florida Gainesville. Thank you, Rich. Sure thing. Always a good time. I want to thank our local organizers, Jeff Willis, Ulf Pearson, and everybody else here, the people in the blue shirts, you guys. Thank you so much for helping us. I really appreciate making this happen. This is really great. That guy on the camera there, that's Ray Ortega. He's from the American Society for Microbiology. They let him come here and film this, uh, and I really appreciate it. You can find him at the Podcaster Studio. Dot com. He's if you, that what? Start your own podcast. Yes. So he, if you want to learn how to podcast, go to Ray. And I want to thank the audience for being here today. I know you have other things to do, and we really love it uh, that you've come here. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another twiv is viral. <laughs> <laughs>